So wanted to say thanks for the invitation. I had some nice chats with John when we were kind of exploring things to talk about. And the idea of really kind of talking about the school, where the, where the schools come from, where we're going, seemed, uh, he thought it might be of interest to the group. I also noticed in, as some people were coming in, that we've got some folks that I know, so they'll keep me honest. We've got some faculty here too, so uh, we'll make sure I say things that are correct. Now, before I jump into the school, I wanna share a little, just a little bit about kind of my background because I think you'll sense how it influences how I approach the School of Design. So throughout, so I was born and raised in Missouri, St. Louis, I'm a city kid. This is probably the smallest town I've actually lived in for an extended period of time. So it's been a, a fun um, addition to my set of life experiences. I love the traditional neighborhood design of Brookings, the fact that I can walk my dog, the grocery store is five minutes away. So I'm really enjoying the atmosphere that Brookings brings. And so born and raised in Missouri, my first degree in Missouri, they do not have a program in landscape architecture anywhere in the state. They have reciprocity with Kansas. So as a young person, those words, those two words never came together for me. So I went and did my bachelor's in horticulture, where then I discovered landscape architecture with a professor there at uh, Mizzou, University of Missouri. So then broadened out, discovered landscape architecture at Kansas State, went on for the, the MLA, the master's there, and learned that I absolutely loved teaching and the academic setting. I love the way people keep thinking. They're always testing the edges. It's never sedentary, sitting down. So the other thing I wanted though, even though in the master's work, I, I had the chance to teach in some of the undergrad programs at Kansas State, the faculty that had some practice experience behind them, five, six, seven, 10 years, I felt like they really brought a richness to the classroom. So being young, you know, life's forever. I said, I'm gonna do this. So I'm gonna go into practice for 15 years. Then I'm gonna get my PhD and then I'm gonna teach. Well, I managed to work for, for nine years for Missouri State Parks, which was a fantastic experience because I got to work through everything from design, on-site construction, planning, community engagement. With the state agency, I was able to experience the whole breadth of the profession. Then ended up going to Arizona State, again, another expansion to the PhD in environmental design and planning. And my emphasis was on community engagement in design visioning. So that's how that academic pathway kept building and building, and I kept broadening and finding connections. And that's really important to how I think about the School of Design. I have shared with uh, Carolyn, and she gave it for you, and you can find it on the webpage. If you go to my profile, you'll find a short history, a few publications, but you also find some links that I think are also kind of help explain who I am. One of the links is to the APLU, Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. I've been working with them for over 10 years now on employability skills. And what are those essential ingredients that students need when they walk out, especially with the baccalaureate and what will help them succeed. And it's surprising how some of the, most important skills are, does a new employee understand their role in the workplace? Do they know what their job is? Or do they, can they identify their job? Are they persistent? How can we help them build persistence to when the job gets kind of bumpy, which they all do, how do they have the fortitude to stay? So there's a host of skills in there, which I think you might find interesting if that's your deal. And a lot of those skills actually come to students through the liberal arts education. So again, that's a connection with research work I've been doing to how I'm thinking about the school and how I work in the College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. You'll find in there a link of publications, 
which all academics, we have to do that. Um, that's how we're measured. There's also a link to, I've been working for a while now with a, a group called the uh, Signage Research and Education Board. It's fascinating to think about on-premise signage, so that like downtown signage, and how all that connects with actually the built environment and the visual arts. So that was one of my first real connections besides doing art in the landscape, creative placemaking, that notion of how art and design really do come together. There's also a link to what I call my field sketchbook. The um, international travel is one of my, that's my carrot. That's why I work so I can travel. And you'll see as I travel, I do like to sketch in my sketchbook. So in there are sketches from around the world. So that can give you a little bit of a sense of um, kind of how I get to the ways I think about the School of Design. So with the school, I may have this date a little off, but around between 2010, 2012, with uh, President Shi Quinn, there was the idea of, in the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, building a college of schools. And the first one that was promoted was a school of design. So this college is now an entire college of schools. So they have achieved that goal of creating that, that college system. So they went from 20 plus department heads and things to now seven schools, which makes for a really nice size working group across the college. And then each of the schools has related disciplines, related subject areas within that director's um, supervision or uh, you know leadership. So with the schools, there were some goals. And one of them was to help enhance the idea of collaborations across like or kindred units and disciplines that we have. Some of it to reduce the silos, because as we know, in the real world, it's not siloed. It's, there's constant working across, working with different people, working with different disciplines. That notion of advancing new knowledge is really the cutting edges in these interdisciplinary or perhaps transdisciplinary zones. So making the schools helps us create those relationships within the people we have here at uh, SDSU. The third thing that was also coming along with this creation of the schools was the idea to accredit as many of the majors that had accrediting bodies. So about 2015, the School of Design is officially formed. They had to be a department for a year. In 2015, they became the first official school. With that, we have architecture, landscape architecture, interior design, graphic design, and studio arts. So in lumping it, it's the built environment and the visual arts all brought together into the one unit. And that honestly is why I moved to South Dakota, was that idea of coming and working with this fascinating breadth of faculty in how do you create a school? Where do you find those interconnections that are really important and that will help advance all of our fields and our passions? The so the school was made in 2015. I actually arrived in the fall of 2018. So they had a settling in period of just getting the paperwork going. Um, the previous director of visual arts, he then worked as a while for the director. He wanted to retire. He hung out for a little longer to help see this vision made. Then there was an interim director for a year while the searching and then so then that's how I came in in the fall of 2018. The school has achieved some pretty significant landmarks in a short period of time. I give all the credit to the faculty. All this groundwork was prepared before I got here. We are now 
all five majors are housed within the school. It takes a while, especially in a university, to get everybody lined up. So all five majors now are programs um, in the school with the director. This, this last piece fell in when uh, Brian Rex accepted a new position to lead a architecture program in Canada, which uh, is a wonderful opportunity for him. He's great at visioning and building programs and they will benefit a lot from him there. So with that, we now have all five majors set in the school. We also, and this happened during COVID, all five of our majors are accredited by their accrediting bodies. That is very significant. The, my second year here, we had three accrediting teams on campus within a year and a half. So there was a lot of the self-evaluation work, getting ready for the teams, responding to team reports. So it was really nice to now have that settled out with all everybody accredited. So what I'm really working on now, the, the next piece of the vision is to identify those interdisciplinary sweet spots. So we keep the disciplinary strength, but there are strategic times when our students can come together and learn about each other, learn how to work with each other. Employability skills really is the basics of that and learning how to work with these folks that they're gonna have <clears throat> for the rest of their life. With the interdisciplinary, the School of Design, the first curriculum was set up so that the first year was all the students together. So they had a couple design studios, some lectures, but it was really what we would call a horizontal common core. Now that is, that's the experience I went through at Kansas State. I had two years of common core where I was with the landscape architects, interior designers, architects, and construction managers. But our students have changed. S students are different today. They have their strengths, they have their weaknesses, but they're definitely different. And students today need a direct connection from day one with the faculty of their major. So in the studio arts, the fine arts, those students were getting those connections because fine, our studio arts does lead really the bulk of this interdisciplinary design exposure, but we had all the other majors, they needed that connection. We also realized that then students graduated with a capstone within their major. They were never brought back together again as seniors when they actually then had something to say about their major. Put a bunch of freshmen together. I'm an architect. I'm a landscape architect. Great. They have no clue what they're talking about. They're freshmen. You know, um, they have an idea. That's wonderful. But by the time they're seniors, they have some experiences, they have some knowledge and skills, and then they can actually start to have these interdisciplinary conversations. So what we did is we turned from a horizontal common core to what I'm calling a vertical common core. I'll go through the details on that, but one thing that did is in the previous model, a lot of the studio art faculty carried the common core at the entry level, at freshman level. The vertical common core allows the studio art faculty and, the, and to bring the arts conversations and experiences to the students every single year throughout their time here. Because I am a believer that the arts and the built environment, they grew up together, but over time they got siloed. And so how can we help bring those conversations back together when appropriate and help our students then be able to work in that interdisciplinary world that we all live in? So now the Common Core for a freshman, they take what we call DSGN 121, that's our intro to design studio, half the class, say a cohort of 120 freshmen, let's say there's 50 to 60 in a big studio. And then there's three faculty, two to three faculty in with that cohort of students. So Molly Wicks leads 
that common core 121 for us. So we have some consistency over the three sections we do offer, two in the fall, one in the spring, and so that we have some consistency over time of understanding these basic design principles that the students are exposed to in a way that they can have an absolute blast, such as the wearables that they do in the parade. If you saw that uh, this last homecoming, the um, Rock the Runway project. So you've got the wearables, so there's some, a three-dimensional feel. They also do some amazing um, composition work, drawings, paintings, collages. I've actually turned some of that freshman work into postcards now that we can use in the school. So the Common Core, that's the, in theory, their fall semester. Then in the spring semester, they have what we call DSGN 110. That is creative thinking. Because the other thing that we kind of realized is all, all of our disciplines come from a creative mindset. So the tools of creating creative thinking are really useful. Divergent, convergent, lateral, the, you know, using the five thinking hats. So to expose those techniques to freshmen. So you've heard the idea, you have to tell them three times, maybe five. So give them all the, the tools that we have early freshman year, but we also teach them how to work in teams, basic teamwork skills. Some people might know the forming, storming, norming, and adjourning. So we walk them through the process with early teams. So that then, as they work in teams throughout their major or with other projects, they've got some skills to fall back on. And they've at least heard the words and they understand that the joy of forming, but there's going to be a creative tension zone, the storming zone, where, yes, things may not be totally smooth, but wow, it, the process is totally worth it. So help them know where they're going. Then, in their sophomore and their junior year, they take what I call a hop the fence elective. So if you're in the built environment, <clears throat> each year you pick an elective that you take in the visual arts. If you're in the visual arts, we have a category of electives that they can select from to take something in the built environment. This takes our studio art faculty and moves them from teaching the freshmen having a, all of their time really set in teaching that freshman core to now teaching students in their advanced studios. So hopefully a student would take ceramics or painting one, painting two, and really get a chance to meet with those faculty within their specialty and hone in on a skill. And the students get to pick what they take. So they're there because they wanna be there. Then in the spring of the senior year, we have the School of Design capstone. I call those passion projects. We will launch our first set of that capstone next spring, 2023. I've asked that it will all be one class. So all the students, all 120 will be registered in one class. And then we will have breakout groups or subsections led by two faculty. So we can have up to five or six of these uh, breakout groups. With the faculty, I've said it's a two credit class. Think of something fun that you've always wanted to do. Pair up with a faculty member not in your major, and I'll give you 20 to 24 students, a little bit of cash, go have fun and have that interdisciplinary experience. I'm a firm believer in experience. So um, you might be catching on, I'm a constructivist at heart. I do it, I feel it, I, I understand it. Then I'm able to step back and go, okay, now I understand how this all works together. So the passion projects can be anything the faculty wanna do. And a few, some really exciting ideas are starting to emerge. We have a uh, landscape architects pairing with artists. Um, we've got um, a studio, a graphic designer looking at 
pairing up with some built environment work. So I'm super excited to offer this opportunity to the students and just see where it goes. So that's the new vertical common core that happens in the school. All of the disciplinary depth is maintained in this structure. Nothing has adjusted out of that. It's just now they're touching their disciplinary faculty year one through year four. The other thing I've created to help me navigate the school and the faculty into this 20, what are we, 21st century interdisciplinary world, I've created a director's art and design council. I'm looking, I, it has been created. Our first on-campus meeting will be in April. So when I set out with the council, what I was looking for was people who were in the upper echelons of their, their firm, their company, their, their practice, so that they have a life of experience, a lifetime of experience that they can come and bring to me and help me make sure I'm appropriate for what's needed in the workplace. And these people have an interdisciplinary sense to their work. As they've evolved through their career pathway, they've learned to find these connections and build things together. So I am going to go through the list with you just very briefly. It's on the web page too. It's under the director's um, introduction or welcome. But we have um, six people who are on the inaugural committee. We have Ed Bennett. He is a graduate of ours. He is now the executive vice president of 10,000 Design out of Minneapolis. We have Terry Burke Bugler. He is a senior principal with Confluence. It's a landscape architecture and engineering firm out of Chicago. And both of these, um, I think I can say all of these, do work at a national scale. They're not just South Dakota based. We have Jeff Davis, who is a regional leader for HOK, which is an international design firm that has across the entire built environment. And he's based out of St. Louis in Missouri. And I'm sorry, I don't know if I said Terry's based out of Chicago. We have uh, Dale Lamphere, who as you all know, is our South Dakota Artist Laureate, and he's based out of Sturgis. We have Stacy McMahon. She is with Coke Hazard. She is the Director of Design Operations, and she's out of Sioux Falls. We also have Jared Neshti, which is with TSP, a large architecture and engineering firm out of Sioux Falls. And Jared is the Principal and Chief Executive Officer of this large uh, architectural and engineering firm. So, I'm super excited to have them all here, host them all here in April, and we'll definitely get them over to the museum. Hopefully I can get them to a play or a musical or, or uh, an orchestra or something like that. So if you guys know of good things coming, coming up, I'll work with everybody to get our team through. So that's kind of where we're at with the School of Design. COVID slowed me down for easily a year to 18 months, but I think we're, we're coming out of it. We have all of our faculty are uh, as healthy as they can be. The students are so excited to be back. We did teach all last year face-to-face. -face. So we had a mad scramble before classes started to move people around so that they could have the six foot distancing we had the mask requirement and then getting everybody the appropriate cleaning supplies in their classrooms so that we could be as safe as possible. I think the students were thrilled that we did do a face-to-face -face model. Of course, there's always a few that had, were anxious, but the majority um, were glad to be here. Teaching ceramics online just doesn't work really well. And the big design studios just doesn't translate very well to Zoom. So that was part of my push to the School of Design will be face-to-face -face, um, as we navigated through COVID. I'm open to any questions, thoughts, topic areas you guys want to explore. 
Should I turn it back to Lynette or Carolyn? Yeah, yeah. I would just encourage anybody to turn their microphone on and maybe their camera and uh, ask questions, or you can put them in the chat as well. Yeah, I'm just Sorry. curious um, oh. if this is. Were you going to add something else, Carolyn? Before I no. ask. No. Oh, okay. Um, I'm wondering if. Uh, is this unique to South Dakota or do other universities have this kind of uh, cooperation and con coordination of different school or different departments becoming a school? I'm going to say the connection of art through architecture that we have here is unique from what I could find at other universities. There are times when the art department connects with one of the built environment, landscape architecture, architecture, but it seems like those are more um, organized connections. They're not in a school altogether. So, and that again is why I came here because I thought this is pretty darn cool what they have put together. And it was also then a chance for me to bring the art the art side of my life and the built, and so, built environment side of my life back together and help pull those. So that is one of the aspects that we're really trying to build into our recruiting is that if you come here, you will have this vertical common core, you'll have these sets of experiences, which will help build your employability skills. The parents love it when I connect and say, hey, these are employability skills. Mm -hmm. Prudence, I saw you were. Yeah, I was just curious, Pat. I think it's great that you expose the students to other areas. And I'm just curious um, when they do that, how many of them, you know, learn about something that they didn't know they had an interest in and either get a double major or change their major? In the, in the freshman year, we do have some movement of majors. We have a little bit in the sophomore year. But I'll be honest, when people come to one of these majors, they're there for a reason. You know, there's something, so there's a passion there for whichever major they're selected. There is some, a little bit of movement with, um, within the visual arts and within the built environment. But what I hope they really get and they walk away with is actually through the experience, a respect, a respect for what each of these disciplines does and contributes to our society. And then with that respect, they know how to work with each other in a, a project of, of something that can happen. I know re respect may seem like a simple thing I'm asking for, but if just respect of what the different disciplines and different people bring to our society. There's a student feedback on this. What do they think about this program? Um, our retention rate, so, I'll get, our retention rates are extremely high. And retention is a reflection of student satisfaction. The other thing we do is every class has, at this university, they call them idea forms. It's student feedback on every single class. The idea forms, again, are another form of student satisfaction. They don't measure learning, but they measure, are the students happy? Are they valuing? what they've gotten. Our idea of scores across the entire school are exceptionally high, which to me is an indicator of students are happy with their experiences. I have students who anecdotally, I have a landscape architecture student taking the ceramics class right now. And she has just casually shared with me how she just loves that ability to work in three-dimensional form at a smaller scale. Landscape architecture is just 3D at a big scale with people involved. Um, she loves that ability to 
think three dimensionally through through the ceramics. So I I honestly believe the students are happy. I know they really like that we've now made it so that they have a class in their major first semester freshman year. So those are the evidences I have to answer your question. Thank you. Um, could you just, mm -hmm. Caroline, you want to read the oh, question? Well, and I was going to just uh, piggyback on that. You know, we hire summer interns and so um, generally, I have a graphic design intern, and we've had great results from that, and uh, students who are really appreciating their experience at SDSU, um, but um, two graphic design interns ago, the, her major was actually interior design, but she had a passion for graphic design and did a fantastic job for us in, in that area because she brought a, a broader perspective, I think. Um, and then one of our student workers is a landscape architect major, and he does graphic design projects for us as well right now. So I, I like to see that uh, cross-discipline experience that they're getting. Well, and it's great that they're giving, getting the museum experience too. It's well, just, it's, it's definitely a real world hands-on, yeah, you know, got to turn it out kind of an environment. Mm -hmm. Um, is, is, that a, is that a part of your curriculum to have um, some um, practicums in real life situations? In graphic design, interior design, studio art, there is a required practicum uh, experience. In landscape architecture, they can do a travel studies or a practicum or an internship placement. So architecture does not have an internship requirement, but it is highly encouraged and we do help place students with a lot of the firms in Sioux Falls. So it's a bit of a mixed bag across the school, but it is highly valued and encouraged. I think there was a question in the chat from Anne. Can you, uh, let's see if I can open the chat and see chat right here. It says, uh, it says, could you discuss the urban design studio trips that were the subject of a recent SDSU alumni magazine article? Do other divisions also do this? So um, urban design studio subject of a recent alumni magazine. Can you give me location? I need you to help prompt my memory. Because recently it would also be almost two years ago because we've had a shutdown on travel. Anne, did you want to unmute or add some additional information to the chat? Oh, to Miami, oh. Pat. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, that is a trip we did authorize for our landscape architecture students. It's embedded in a classroom where the urban design studio, and because we're in Brookings, which is a wonderful traditional uh, rural community experience, we do want to get them out to larger urban settings just as part of their education. The students get to pick which town they want or which city they want to go to, and they work with the professor to um, pick that location. And this last group wanted to go to Miami. The current group wants to go to Alaska. They we're still kind of debating that one, trying to figure out how they're going to work that out and how it will meet the learning objectives. So that's an embedded in architecture. There is an embedded trip to Chicago. We also have travel, required travel experiences across the majors. So that can get to um, either spring break travel, I'll call it Maymester travel. That's right between graduation when summer classes start, so you can get two, three weeks in there. And we also have summer travel. This year, we are definitely sending folks to Italy and the United Kingdom, two groups of students going out for sure. 
We are working on a third group going to South Korea, but we're holding off on that because we want to see what the quarantine requirements are doing before we send students to go quarantine for a week in an international country, it may be better to do a domestic travel with those groups. The um, one thing we do also have is, and some of this is for about 15 years now, um, I've worked with the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency and the Technical Assistance to Brownfields program, TAB program. And one of the things they do is they offer community visioning services to rural communities throughout the US. And so every year I do one to four community visioning projects with communities. This year, I've hired a student to work with one community in uh, Caney, Kansas. We also now have, we're doing an inter, it's one of my first experience, we're doing an interdisciplinary design studio with our Kansas City, Kansas, uh, Kansas, yes, right near Oklahoma. So we have eight students and four faculty. So we have landscape architecture, architecture, graphic design, and interior design represented across the faculty and the students just oh, 10 days ago or so. Took all the students four days down. They did public meetings three sets of public meetings where they led the facilitating tables. Oh, it was a blast watching them work with the community. So sorry, long-winded answer. Well, I have another question. <laughs> um, since this began in 2015, but maybe really wasn't up and running till a few years later. Have you had any graduates that have gone through this entire program and are now all in the workforce? And what kind of job, if so, you know, what kind of jobs are they getting? Um, our, our placement rates across the school are actually quite high. We run 90% plus placement rates. Now, some of that, whether it's in art education or with a firm, so five majors, you know, we're, we're really diverse in how people get placed, but it is um, very high rates for the students being able to get jobs. We've been working with the studio art faculty. We did this um, early COVID, so 2020-ish, we created a flyer to work with our students who are potentially interested in studio art to identify the job opportunities that come out with this type of education. Because I think in working with the young people and the parents, we needed to help them see that this is a professional pathway that a young person can look at. I can't quote all the jobs and things that people did, but it does point to the diversity of what a solid education in the fine arts, um, creative thinking sets people up for to succeed in various employment opportunities, whether it be with museums, whether it's starting their own um, artist studio, working with schools, those kinds of things. Thank you. Well, Pat, I don't know if everyone who's visiting today is aware that we have a nice partnership with the Museum Studies Minor, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. I thought you might want to talk about <laughs> Donna. I'll let you have the glory. Go for it. No, please. I'm still learning about it since I haven't been here for one full, um, you know, interim of it. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on the minor and uh, where it's going. Okay, um, all right, well, you, you can tag team with me, okay? All right, so um, we do have a minor in museum studies that was created, oh, Carolyn, five, six years ago? Okay, don't know. Um, it's, it's on the new side of life for academia, but um, it is a minor, and SDSU does require if you don't have a BFA, which is a uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts, which all of our majors do, 
if you have a, a BA or a BS, you do have to complete a minor. So we have a museum studies minor with at least five tracks that a student can come explore. So you could be really into ag education. Um, we have the botanical garden, we have the children's museum. Of course, we have the South Dakota Art Museum. <clears throat> but we have tracks that students can come in and take these four to six courses and walk out with a minor in museum studies. Part of the required coursework is a placement or an internship level experience with um, one of the museums here in town. And I also include the uh, Mercury Gardens as a botanical collection. So just last year, we did receive some, uh, some donor support to help us advance the museum studies area here at South Dakota. <clears throat> and Leda Compellen, who created the minor and is the lead with it, she um, used that funding to work with our folks here. And we launched a, it ended up being an international four or five day symposium on museum studies with kind of the big question might be, now that we've gone through COVID, what does that mean for museum studies? And so the answers were extremely broad. And how does that impact um, how we approach generally museum work? And we had some pretty amazing keynote speakers. Donna was one of them for us. And Donna, can you name the other keynotes we had? It was an impressive list. It was a really nice list, but I, I don't have it right in front of me, so I would leave someone off. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, one of the keynotes was from the United Kingdom, um, one of them uh, East Coast. So Leda did an amazing job of pulling together some really top-notch keynote speakers and then um, 100 plus participants for that one. And we are continuing that work. We are getting ready to launch what we hope will be a museum studies, I'm gonna call it a fellowship or a fellow where we can host a graduate from another university, somebody in museum studies, upper division masters, early PhD, to come here to SDSU and have a fellowship experience here with us, partnering with the, our partners here. So they could have a diversified experience, they could focus in, we're, we're really early in figuring out what that fellow is gonna be. Donna, did I hit the highlights? Oh, I think so. I'm just so glad that we have the opportunity to, to share in this with you guys. And so um, in the summertime, when you all see interns running around and sometimes during the school year too, um, those are all coming um, as a result primarily of this museum studies program. And we've had some just really outstanding uh, students participate. We also like to, um, uh, several of our students, workers actually also come from the School of Design, Pat, and we've been really seeing the effects of those employability skills in the young people that we have working. <laughs> Good. So. Um, and you have another question. Um, you have another question in the chat. It's from Karen Kinder, and she says, I studied art at Northern State in Aberdeen from 1969 to 1973. I came out of a small school with no art, so I arrived there with no background in design. I found it to be a fuzzy, nebulous subject. Do students come in now with an understanding of design that grows while at SDSU? Not really. <laughs> um, and this, I think, is the beauty of our DSGN 121, our introductory studio experience, and the work that Molly and the two other faculty that we bring in. Oh, and I'm sorry, those faculty, I try to get from as many disciplines as possible, so lots of exposure for us internally, because if our faculty know what's going on in 121, they can help build those skills. But I think the 121 does an amazing job of helping students understand there isn't always a black and white answer. And that they learn um, the beauty of exploring and experimenting 
and it's okay to do it wrong. That's an employability skill too, that it's okay to fail as long as you keep growing while you're doing it and you keep your boss out of trouble. I am gonna um, drop a link in the chat to anyone who's interested for the uh, schedule for that museum study symposium. So you can see the high quality of program that the School of Design um, facilitated in putting together. You have another one. Are there any plans to extend student collaborations outside the of the School of Design? For example, graphic design and communication journalism or data science majors. Those are conversations that have been kind of, I'll say, thrown over the bow a little bit. Especially with, say, uh, communication um, at Kojo. Uh, ah, communication and journalism, yeah, the school there. Um, data science has come up a lot. The data science is actually coming up more in the research arena. And we're looking at some partnerships with our graphic design faculty and data science folks in how do you visualize data. So that hap is happening through the scholarship side. As far as with our students, um, every, I'll be honest, everybody right now, we're, the faculty are coming out of COVID and the COVID hangover is huge. Everybody, including myself, people are so exhausted right now that just helping them get their feet back underneath them. And I try to not push too much right now in this last year because of the exhaustion. And that's exhaustion from teaching classes face-to-face -face through all of this, um, managing their own family whether it's kids or seniors or whatever that extended structure may be, people are just tired. So I'm hoping that as the advisor, the director's art and design council comes on board and we keep walking a little further away from COVID that there's some energy for these more student collaborations, research collaboration activities. The, the Arc City project I mentioned is an early step into that. And that was something that I was able to, to bring forward. And I will be turning the lead of that project over to another faculty member after we get it settled in. And we're looking at a large grant that will help support that work. And ideally then as we go on, all five majors continuing to participate. So that's a really, it's a very timely question, but I've just been trying to slow walk us into some of this let people recover, trying to be sensitive to that human side of life right now. I can be high energy. I can be a lot to take in. Well, um, are there any final questions? I don't see anything more in the chat. Going once. Well, thank you, Dr. Crawford. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, it sounds like such an exciting program. I think our students are very lucky to have this opportunity. Um, so, um, yeah, wish I were young and <laughs> starting <laughs> over. Um, with that, um, I think we'll uh, move into the business part of our meeting. Okay. And um, once again, let's all thank uh, Dr. Crawford. She did a great job. Yes, definitely. Well, all right. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank John too for the opportunity to come share what's happening with the school. And it's a subject I like talking about. So anytime. And if you have ideas, definitely, you know, talk to Donna, um, talk to me, and we'll see what we can figure out.